we're going to get really bad. And it turns out we've done a really good job. I mean, more or less, we've had our little bumps here and there, but compared to a lot of other places, we're doing really, really well. So because of that, I know that the energy of the classroom is better. And I think that you learn better when you're in class. And really, I just miss having you all here. So next semester, you want to zoom in, you got to ask me first. Like, that's just how it's going to be because I miss having you here. And I know just looking at grades across a variety of classes, um, people who are Zooming in when they could be in class, I think they've been struggling a little bit. And I know that it's a stressful time. I know that it's easier to stay in your room and Zoom in, but I think it's hurting your learning ability. And so I'm going to make an extra hurdle if you want to do that, because I would much rather have you here. I really would. Um, so um, next semester, I'm expecting people who can be in person to be in person. Oh, um, so that's kind of what I'm saying. So because um, I know that if you're quarantined, that's different. But if you're healthy enough to be here, y'all should be here. Like, it's more fun when you're here. I know you'd be here. I know you'd be here. I was making rules. Like, it's different when you're quarantined or when you're sick. But <laughs> by the way, y'all, um, uh, we saw on Robbie the post-it notes, the sign that says we're, we're bored. <laughs> it kind of looks like we ate bored <laughs> from our perspective outside. But I saw that last week when I was taking Smedley for a walk and I'm like, oh, oh, I'm so sorry that you're bored. Oh, that's yours. <laughs> okay, that's really funny. I, I hope that you are finding ways to manage your time. So I just wanted to say that um, I know that things have been difficult this semester. I know that there are a lot of things that you were kind of hoping for that didn't necessarily happen. Um, did anybody go to Hanging of the Greens this weekend? Can somebody explain to me how the ice skating thing worked? Because it looks like you all had skates with blades on. They weren't? Eh. Oh. I don't know. Oh. Oh, okay. You didn't want to ice skate? It's just like rollerblading, except uh, see, when I was in the 90s, rollerblading was everything. And now apparently it's making a comeback. And I'm like, hey, in my world, it never left. <laughs> um, I just wanted to let you know, I appreciate you so much this semester. I know it's been really hard. And I know that maybe things haven't turned out the way that you wanted them to. But I want you to know, like, compared to eight weeks doing remote, this is so much better than that. And I really do treasure all the time that I get to teach you. I really do. Like, even when I'm frustrated, I love teaching y'all and I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, so thank you for all the hard work you've put in this semester. We're not done yet. We got another writing assignment. We've got some quizzes. We've got uh, a project, you know, so we have more to do. But I, I, I just kind of want to impress, like, if you're having a hard time, especially now, just know that it's not going to be this way forever. I woke up this morning and folks, we now have three vaccines. We have three. That's amazing. So we have a lot to look forward to. Um, so the next couple of months might be probably some of the hardest ones because we know an ends in sight, but we still have to keep doing it. So dig deep. I'll be making some videos over the break to share with everybody about how to deal with your stress and different stuff like that, uh, just for your own benefit. But I wanted to let you know, thank you for making this a good semester. Uh, teaching cognitive psychology is one of my favorite classes, and I'm so glad you got to be a part of it, even if it doesn't exactly look the way like the way that we normally teach it. All right, so with that in mind, I think you are going to like today. And by the way, I got a lot of questions about the Wayson task. Um, if you have any other questions, please let me know. Um, and I am going to be generous with the scoring on this just because I know that logic is hard. <laughs> okay. 
So the last time that we were here, we were talking about mental models. Um, so what we are looking at here, um, we were talking about uh, models and the role of possibility versus necessity. So when we're talking about something that's possible, we only really need one model because we're talking about something that is absolutely not assured. Compare that to something like necessity, where we abs this is absolutely how things have to be. When we're talking about necessity, we are going to need significantly more information than we would normally need. We need more. And so because of that, um, we actually need more information and many, many, many models to be able to make that difference and make that distinction. We're gonna get to the good stuff in a minute. We're gonna talk about logical fallacies today. My glasses are falling up. Also, today's lecture has been brought to you today by Lush's Handy Guru Goo. It is good for my hands. It is the only thing that gets rid of my eczema. Apparently getting rid of my pop socket on the back of my phone helped too, which is kind of weird. <laughs> but it was not cheap, but it is the only thing that works. Oh, it's got pumpkin seed butter. Neat. <laughs> also, you probably should have received an email from Nancy Curbs, and you will get reminders in, in, the, uh, in the coming weeks about course evaluations. Take some time to fill those out. Remember that they're used to make uh, decisions, especially related to promotion. Um, Dr. G will be going up for full professor in a couple of years. So it would be, it would be nice to have good numbers. <laughs> but really what I want more than good numbers is your honesty. That is far, far more important to me because if there are things that I can fix, I would like to be able to do that. <laughs> And I'm kind of hoping, I'm kind of hoping we don't have to do this Zoom thing forever because I think I'm a better teacher when I'm not on Zoom, I think, personally, but that's just me. I mean, you do get to see me do interesting things with my eyebrows, like, Okay, everybody good? Anybody need some more time? I'm trying to figure out which of these I should have. Should I have the caffeine or should I have the watermelon? I will not drink them both at the same time. This one's citrus, this one's watermelon, and that's disgusting. <laughs> yeah, I think we're gonna go with the caffeine. <laughs> it's one of those days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, got to get it in there. Okay, so here's kind of an example. So we have the mean response time of correct responses. Notice that in general, responding of questions related to possibility, regardless of whether a yes or a no response is required, is generally going to be less than questions that are made on the basis of necessity. Also kind of notice, uh, for those of you who are going to be going on into research methods, we actually have a really interesting interaction here. So what this means is that the pattern of results differs versus probability and necessity. So notice that possibility, no responses take more time than yes responses. So ruling out a possibility requires more information than saying, yes, that's a possibility. 
But here's what's kind of interesting. When we go into necessity where we need more information, it flips. So now, yes responses take much more time because noticing necessity means that we have to have multiple mental models. We need a significantly greater amount of information to say, yes, this is something that is by necessity required. So we need more information for necessity than for possibility. And that's especially true if we're trying to make a yes response. So that's kind of interesting. So what do we say about mental models? Um, so generally they provide us with good, we have good evidence for them. This is really similar to the kind of things that we do every day. So we have a mental, we have mental models and we have mental models of everything that kind of goes on around us, including the people that we work with, um, the different people that we encounter in our everyday lives and different states of affairs. So we do these mental models all the time. We do them when we read, we do them when we reason, we do them when we make decisions. So there's a lot of parsimony here because this looks like a lot of what we do all the time. The problem is we're focusing on we, we don't really know the underlying processes of how these mental models are created. So that's the first issue. The second issue is that people are going to use these models differently. And interestingly enough, there's a lot of tying mental models to working memory capacity. And we know that there are individual differences in working memory abilities. So it stands to reason that there should be individual differences in how we do these mental models, but nobody's really looked at that. And then finally, I, I just like to remind you that mental models are kind of based on something called the principle of truth. We include information that is true. We do not include any information that is false. So this means that we are always operating on a basis of confirmation, supporting what we already believe, and we're not really working from a principle of falsification with these mental models. And so that's a potential issue. Now, we apparently have all kinds of packages coming in the house today, in addition to the hand cream, which I was excited to get before lunch, but um, I'm going to be a little embarrassing. I've got Taylor Swift vinyl coming tonight and a Taylor Swift sweatshirt. So if you are around on campus tomorrow, you will get to see me wear the Taylor Swift sweatshirt. And if you'd like to laugh at me for my cheesy musical taste, you're more than welcome to do so. <laughs> I already told the Gen Psych class, I like some Imagine Dragons songs, and let's be clear, Imagine Dragons is spicy Nickelback. Yay, folklore. Yeah, it's the best album she's ever done. I'm going to say it. <laughs> All right, everybody good? Okay, I think you're gonna like this next part. Informal reasoning and logical fallacies. Okay, so this is from your book, but I thought it might be kind of interesting to talk about. So I'm gonna read some arguments. And I'd like you to determine if you notice any fallacies or logical flaws in any of these arguments. Okay, so here's the first argument. Tell me what you think about it. The use of soft drugs, I think by soft, they mean like magic mushrooms. <laughs> I don't think they mean like cocaine. Um, the use of soft drugs should be legalized in the United States because a number of our allies in Europe and Asia have legalized them. Does anybody see a flaw in that one? Yeah, Robin? I mean, they weren't specific about like drugs. They were specific about like 
Uh-huh. I guess how I see it, talk, but I am assuming they're talking about like mm -hmm. marijuana. Yeah, I think we're talking about cannabis. I think we're talking about psilocybin mushrooms or peyote or stuff like that. Generally ones that are assumed to be uh, less habit forming. You can still have a dependence on them. We learn about that in drugs and behavior, but by and large, the soft drugs tend to be a little less habit forming. Okay. So how about if I change the argument like this, and let's see if you notice the flaw. This is probably the kind of argument you would have made when you were a teenager. Although I know that some of you might still be teenagers, technically. Um, Mom, I wanna go see the R-rated movie. My friends do, my friends are going. Now you're kind of like, well, just because your friends are going is not a sufficient reason for you going, right? So that's the same kind of argument. It's basically saying we should allow soft drugs because Europe and Asia does. Well, if the other countries wanted to jump off a bridge, would you? <laughs> that's kind of the idea. Um, I will kind of say that it's you can make a better argument than everybody else is doing it. It's not a sufficient justification. Okay, how about this one? It's very likely that UFOs exist because no one has been able to prove that UFOs do not exist. Emma's smiling. She's thinking about it a little bit. They're also, they also have to prove that they are real. Mm -hmm. Absence of arguments against something is not an argument for it. <laughs> right, so that's what we call like the argument from ignorance, basically. Just because we haven't proved it doesn't mean it's not real, that kind of thing. Okay. A lack of discipline in adulthood causes students to become criminals in adulthood because it is known that most adult criminals suffered from a lack of discipline in their childhood. Hmm. Thoughts? How about if I said that they were correlated with each other, what would y'all say? You're going to learn to say this a lot in research methods. Correlation does not imply causation. There are plenty of kids that probably had a lack of discipline, but did not grow up to be criminals. Just because they're related doesn't mean there's not potentially other variables coming into play. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Um. Okay, we must stop the movement for a moment of silence in public schools, because once you allow a moment of silence, it soon becomes a moment of teachers leading prayers, and before long, the schools and the government are supporting a specific religion. Have you heard those kind of arguments before, that if you do this, it leads to this, and then it leads to that, and so on? Does anybody know what we call that? That is called the famous slippery slope fallacy. <laughs> okay, so let's talk a little, and, and what's kind of interesting is that you don't have to know about things like modus ponens or modus tollens to recognize when an argument is bad. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the difference between deductive reasoning and the informal reasoning that you and I do every day. So interestingly enough, finding fallacies in informal reasoning, which most of us can do pretty well, is not very well correlated with deductive reasoning. And I know what y'all are thinking, that's good, Dr. Gilchrist. If I learned anything from deductive reasoning last week, it's that I don't like it. <laughs> okay, now here's what's interesting. Now, technically, um, how many of you have heard of the concept of a circular argument? So a circular argument is that you, oh, let's see what we got. Okay. <laughs> um, so a circular argument is basically the idea that, um, so for example, Freud's notion of repression. So basically you could argue against Freud's idea of repression by saying, well, 
I don't have any trauma in my life to repress. So therefore repression cannot be real. But somebody like Freud will say in response, well, of course you don't have any traumatic memories, you repress them. There's no way that the argument can ever be proven false. It keeps recur, it, it's basically recursive. It keeps going back to itself to explain itself. Now, technically, circular arguments are permissible and valid in formal logic, but they're not very convincing in the real world. So if I basically said God exists because God exists, well, that's really convincing, isn't it? From a formal standpoint, this tautology is totally fine. In informal logic, you need something better than this. And now here's what's probably most important of all, and this is what you will love about informal reasoning. So remember last week when I was like, it's only the form that matters, not the content. And some of you were just like, how could the, how could the content not play a role in this? Well, that's what informal reasoning is for. Informal reasoning is far more concerned with the content of the argument than the form of the argument. Um, so the content is important in informal reasoning and it's irrelevant in formal logic. I could basically claim that ghosts exist or that unicorns exist or squares are not real in formal logic as long as it takes the proper argument form. But those kind of arguments will not hold water in informal reasoning because the content is what counts, not the form. So you will like informal reasoning very, very much. And I love talking about flaws in logic because they happen all the time. So for example, and this is not me being political, this is me pointing out an argument. So our, uh, the governor of Missouri was basically asked about a mask mandate a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and last week he actually said that he would not do a mask mandate because a mask ma mandatory masking would lead to mandatory vaccination. So I noticed a couple of things with that argument. First of all, you're the governor. You get to choose both of those decisions. So if you think it's going to be a runaway slippery slope, um, you're kind of the one in charge. Second of all, that is a classic slippery slope. Just like the moment of silence will lead to prayer in schools, will lead to government endorsed religion. Generally, a slippery slope is not a convincing argument, but now that you know what the slippery slope is, You'll be able to notice and identify when other people do it. And y'all, I am gonna care less. So I might on the final, maybe ask you about modus ponens or modus tollens. You know what I think is a lot more fun to ask you about? Make a bunch of silly statements and say, hey, which one of these contains a logical fallacy? So those will be on your final too. And they're a lot more fun to write. Okay. So let's talk about some of these flaws. So what do we know about informal reasoning? So this occurs in argumentation. So in debate with people, with arguments with people, and they tend to be probabilistic. So this means that we're not necessarily talking about our Aristotelian style syllogisms of all blank, all X are Y. Some X are not Y. Um, it'll be more about most or not. We're probably gonna be talking about some probabilities or percentages. So when you're talking with your family, for example, about whether or not you wanna spend Thanksgiving isolated, or you wanna spend Thanksgiving in an extended family situation, you are probably going to be spending a lot of time focusing on probabilities, focusing on what the potential outcomes could be. Now, the strength of a conclusion to an argument depends on a couple of things. First of all, it depends on the strength of the prior conviction. Additionally, it depends on the nature of your new evidence.
So a lot of deductive reasoning tends to operate on a binary. It's true or false. But oftentimes these probabilistic statements, we're going to say that they're possibly true or probably true. We're not going to say, oh, yeah, that's always true. Or yes, that's always false. We're probably talking about things that are true some of the time and are false some of the time. Um, so let me see if there's anything else kind of here that's important. So generally, informal reasoning is for persuading people. We're not necessarily looking for the truth. We're potentially trying to get people on our side. Additionally, one of the ways that this kind of comes into uh, the strength of the prior conviction comes into play, um, generally, we are going to find that people tend to engage in what is called a my-side bias. So that's M-Y-S-I-D-E. So basically, you evaluate statements not in terms of their own matter, or on their own merits, or whether or not they're true, but often you will evaluate these things in terms of your own beliefs and your own behaviors. So it's less about what is true and it's more about how does this apply to me and my life and what I believe. So generally we're gonna find that um, the, when you have evidence that are based on positive arguments, so the tone and the context matters, this is gonna end up having more of an impact on um, on our perceived strength of the conclusion. Um, so for example, um, your textbook kind of talks about um, good and bad explanations for different types of psychological phenomena. Um, and some of these explanations were inclu included neuroscientific evidence for phenomena. Um, and so interestingly, um, students tended to be more impressed by explanations that come with neuroscience evidence, especially if the explanation is really bad. So for whatever reason, neuroscientific evidence makes us more likely to believe a conclusion, especially if the explanation is not a very good one. So if you see some neuroscientific explanations, put your thinking cap on. Think about whether or not it actually supports the argument. So don't write these down. We're gonna go over these in greater detail. Um, these are very common informal fallacies that come from uh, RICO in 2007. So we have things like the appeal to popularity, the argument from ignorance, false cause. So this is a case where we have a correlation and we assume that that means that there's a cause effect relationship, irrelevance, we support a claim by a reason that is not actually relevant to the claim, such as we should have soft drug. Well, actually that would be an appeal of, to popularity. Irrelevance would be, um, we should teach students a foreign language. Every student in the United States should be taught a foreign language because quality education is important. That's not a good reason. How is that specific to learning a foreign language? So that would be an argument from irrelevance. Begging the question. So let's be very clear what begging the question is. Begging the question, it does not mean raising a question. Now, oftentimes when people say begging the question informally, they're like, I'm trying to raise a question. Begging the question in informal reasoning is basically you have to assume you have to already assume what you're trying to prove, such as the argument about repression. That is a case of circular logic and begging the question. And then, of course, our slippery slope. So let's talk about some other very common informal fallacies. So let's talk about the argument from authority. We, in general, are more likely to be swayed by status or credentials than the actual argument itself. So here's what this means. It means you need to put your critical thinking skills into high gear. Just because somebody has a PhD in a particular field 
does not mean that they are an expert on everything. Now, for example, if I tell you the best ways to study for tests and the best ways to jog your memory and that you shouldn't multitask, should you listen to me or at least consider my point of view in that? Okay, I see head nods. You know why? Because I have a PhD in cognition and neuroscience with a, with a, with a big concentration in memory and attention. You should listen to me. But if I tell you, um, if I tell you to stay away from 5G, because I know that scientifically it makes the coronavirus more likely, should you listen to me? No. What do I know about 5G? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> In those cases, I defer to people who actually know what they're talking about. So something that kind of uh, drove me personally up the wall um, this year is that a lot of people who actually are experts in certain fields have been spending a lot of time talking about things outside of their area of expertise. So for example, um, probably back in April, um, there was a chiropractor that was basically making the rounds on YouTube about quick cures for the coronavirus and that it was a hoax and things like that. Now, here's the thing. If I want to get my back cracked, going to a chiropractor might actually be a really good thing. Most of them are doing work with joints and things like that and then the spine. Now, maybe some of them take as part of their training classes on infectious diseases, but that's not generally their area. We have, those of us with expertise have to have a little bit of humility and recognize that our expertise is going to be limited to certain things. So when I tell you that I think it's important to do something like wear a mask, that's not because I'm, that I know anything about infectious diseases. I don't, but I'm interested in deferring to people who do know what they're talking about. And I read peer review articles and there are a lot of things that show that these things kind of work. I'm willing to defer to the experts and have a little humility and say, when I don't know, I'm gonna to defer to somebody who does. But a lot of people assume that just because a doctor said it, that that makes it true. So here's an example. And this is a case where somebody with expertise can get it wrong. So if you had me for biopsych, you might remember that in the first couple of chapters of your biopsych textbook, they talk about frontal lobotomy. Um, this is a sarcastic thumbs up. This is like thumbs up with a scared face. Frontal lobotomies are scary. You can severely damage your quality of life. So Walter Freeman was a researcher who started using frontal lobotomy as a treatment for mental illness. And for those who may not know what a frontal lobotomy is, you basically take a small little uh, metal rod, you either put it into the corner of the eye socket or you put it in through the nose and you basically break into the cribriform plate, uh, a thin bone that basically separates the, um, the uh, skull uh, around the nose uh, to the brain. So this little cribriform plate, you basically break into there, you move it around <laughs> and you basically separate part of the frontal lobe from the rest of the brain. You basically disconnect it. And this can have a severe, detrimental effect on your quality of life. Like somebody who has a frontal lobotomy is never gonna be able to take care of themselves. They're always gonna need help. Um, but here's what's really interesting. He started his surgeries before checking his evidence that they were actually beneficial. And for a lot of people, it turned out that they weren't. Um, but people were willing to believe him because he was a researcher, he was credentialed. And so we ended up doing a lot of harm to people simply because they were, that we assume that if they're an expert, that they know what they're doing. Expertise is limited. That's especially true if you have a PhD. Like you spend six years working on a really tiny little thing. And it's like, I tell you, that means for memory and attention, I know a lot. I know a little lot. I know more about cognitive stuff than non-cognitive stuff. But as we kind of move out, 
of cognition, I know a little bit less. So I can still tell you the best ways to relieve your stress. It's psychology. But at that point, you're probably going to want to talk to somebody who has um, social psychology credentials, maybe medical credentials for uh, dealing with the autonomic nervous system. So as you move further away from that area of expertise, that's when greater humility is required. Sorry, I went on a spiel. <laughs> I have a lot of feelings. All right. The argument from ignorance. If you don't have evidence against a claim, it must be true. We've never found evidence that unicorns don't exist. That means they must exist. All po and, then, and what's really critical here, all possibilities are being treated as equally likely. Evidence of unicorns is apparently just as important as no evidence of unicorns. Um, and here's what I would like to remind you. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. That is the true argument from ignorance. So basically, we haven't found any evidence against aliens, so that means there must be aliens. Now, having said that, our universe is really big. If we're the only life forms on it, that just seems like such a lot of extra space for a lot of nothing. That is what I will say, but I'm also not qualified in that area. And while you're writing this down, I started Christmas shopping. <laughs> I have two teenage nieces. One turns 15 very soon and the other one turns 13 or is 13. Oh my gosh, I'm so old. They all want stuff from Sheen. I'm like, please don't buy from Sheen. Like, no, don't buy from Sheen. I had to explain to my mother yesterday. No mom, I'm like, mom, don't buy from Sheen. Sheen's a shady company, but I'm like, you can buy from ColourPop. ColourPop's not shady. You can buy from NYX, mom. NYX isn't shady. <laughs> it was just cute. She's like, I don't know about this ColourPop. I'm like, I have an eyeshadow palette from the mom. It's all good. I have an eyeliner. It works pretty well. It's fine. <laughs> so I messaged my nieces. I'm like, I'm going to try to buy you something that doesn't suck. But they were very, very clear about getting stuff from Sheen. And I'm like, I'm not doing that for you. Uh, I'm too old. <laughs> like those clothes will fall apart as soon as it goes in the wash. It's just kind of weird. Whatever happened to Forever 21? Are, are, do those stories even still exist? Oh, that I'm like, why aren't they getting stuff from Forever 21? I thought that, like, I'm clearly too old for this. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. They rip off a lot of designs without giving stuff credit. And at least the last I heard, I'm like, mom, they had a big thing where they had necklaces with swastikas on them. I'm like, you don't need to be buying from she. <laughs> All right. Are we good? Okay. Okay, so let's talk about the straw man fallacy. Um, so this is a case where we tend to oversimplify uh, an opponent's position in an argument. And it ultimately creates an artificial argument that is a lot easier to deal with. So one of the examples that I give occasionally is uh, talking about uh, Colin Kaepernick and kneeling on um, the football field. So one of the things that I thought was really interesting as I was listening to this, or as this was happening, he was specifically talking, um, taking a knee for um, police brutality, particularly against black people. And that's something that we're still talking a lot about today. But what I thought was really interesting is that when people started reporting on it, particularly people that um, were against this idea, um, 
they talked about it being against the flag or being against the national anthem or being against veterans or things like that. And that was not what the original argument actually was at all. He made his statement very clear and to people it got distorted into a little bit of a straw man. Now, whether you think Colin Kaepernick uh, should or should not have kneeled on the football field is irrelevant here. What I think is more interesting is how arguments get distorted um, so that they become easier to deal with, despite the fact that it is a misrepresentation of somebody's idea. So we kind of see this all the time in a lot of different ways. So for example, feminism becomes hating men, for another example. It makes it much easier to deal with because if they believe something as illogical as hating men, then I don't have to listen to the rest of the argument because it's just so ridiculous. But that's not what it actually is. It is a misrepresentation. Can anybody else think of any other straw man arguments that we might be dealing with? Um, yeah. Ah, uh, yes, the all lives matter thing, yes. Um, so the, the argument between Black Lives Matter and all lives matter. And so that is a case where it gets misrepresented into only being about helping Black people and helping nobody else in certain cases. Anybody else? I mean, I can tell you I've done this when I talk about QAnon with other people. <laughs> um, I probably misrepresent that too. Like if somebody who really, really believed in Q, I'd be like, oh yeah, it, it's basically like a Monsters Inc. parody where they believe that politicians like need to feed off of the fears of children by making them scream. It's basically the plot of Monsters Inc. Um, now that's very oversimplified. And if I brought that up to somebody who was involved in that, they would go, well, that's not it at all. It's much, much more complicated than that. And so that's a case where I might be oversimplifying a particular stance. Uh, that is definitely far more complex. I would tell you to look into it, but I'm a little worried you might go down a bit of a rabbit hole. So do at your own discretion or do not. Um, but think about some of the ways that you occasionally have tried to oversimplify somebody's argument so that you wouldn't have to deal with the actual complexities that are addressed. Okay, ad hominem. Ad hominem. So this is a case where an argument turns into a personal attack on somebody's character. So it's no longer a focus on the argument, it is about the other person. So there are actually quite a few different types of ad hominem attacks out there. Um, so for example, there's one type of ad hominem that's referred to as circumstantial ad hominem. So if I'm arguing with somebody and y'all, this has actually come up before. One of my mom's like cousins a while back actually said, you know, I think the professors are indoctrinating their students. I'm like, I can't even get them to read the syllabus sometimes. <laughs> what makes you think I'm capable of that? Um, but if I made an argument, um, you know, if I made an argument that I think, you know, colleges are really beneficial for students, uh, a circumstantial ad hominem attack would basically be, well, of course you believe in something like that. You're a college professor. So it no longer becomes about the argument itself. It becomes the fact that I must be biased because I benefit from that system. So that is a case of a circumstantial ad hominem attack um, or instances where somebody's like, that person was a professor. That's not a real job. And I'm like, um, yeah, hi. 
I work over 40 hours a week making students learn. And they're like, oh, I didn't mean you. You're one of the good ones. I'm like, oh, okay, <laughs> sure. Um, so another example of a circumstantial ad hominem, uh, a father may tell his daughter not to start smoking because she'll damage her health. And she may say, well, you're a smoker, dad. <laughs> Like my parents actually do that all the time. They're like, don't smoke, don't smoke. My mom smokes e-cigarettes, my dad dips. Like they're both telling me not to do it, but they're both doing it. But if I pointed out that they're a smoker, that diminishes the argument because now I'm focusing on the person delivering the argument rather than the argument itself. Um, another type of ad hominem attack that I actually really love is called to coquet which means you also. So I'm gonna tell you a cute little story. Um, so the, when we got Smedley as a puppy, he loved to chew everything. So back in 2017, I was having some problems with my knee. And so I would basically wrap a heating pad around my leg and I would you know, heat it up. Well, Smedley was at that age where he was chewing everything. And one day I forgot to put the heating pad up. Smedley ate plastic <laughs> and my partner got really, really upset with me. And he's like, you know, you shouldn't have left the heating pad out. And I said, well, you leave things out all the time, you know, and Smedley gets into those. Why are you picking on me? That is too cocaine. And that is technically ad hominem. And here's why we're no longer focusing on me messing up and not moving the heating pad. We are now focusing on my partner's behavior, which is not relevant to this particular argument. So to coke is basically also ad hominem because it keeps focus on the person rather than the argument itself. So notice the times where you've done this, where somebody accuses you of being selfish and you're like, well, you're selfish too. Well, that may be, but it's not relevant to the argument. And that is ad hominem. Now, there are a couple of other types, including guilt by association and also abusive ad hominem. So this is a case where we are directly attacking somebody's character. So uh, in particular, um, you can see these kind of uh, ad hominem attacks when we're talking about political debates. So for example, um, my opponent was wrong in the past. He is therefore wrong now ad hominem. So notice the different ways that those kind of play a role. So I believe that this is all I have, and I'm going to go ahead and stop here. Um, we will start talking about aspects related to language. Uh, check your email on Monday. I will be sending you links to lectures. We will be meeting asynchronously. So what this means, you get to watch the lectures at your speed whenever you want. Um, so let's kind of keep this in mind, though. If you have any questions, this would absolutely be a great time to shoot me an email, hop on the Discord, ask me anything you like, and our office hours will be on Discord. Since um, we won't be meeting in real time, it's really, really important that you get in touch with me. If there's anything you need, you know, I'd love to help you out. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Take care of yourselves. Make good decisions.